Forgetting everything that's been said, rising to minimal levels of morality, let's try to answer the question. Uh, well, we can start by asking uh, how should a um, long series of countries around the world react to Western state terrorism? So to take, just take one uncontroversial case, how should Nicaragua react to U.S. terrorism against Nicaragua? I mean, that case is uncontroversial because we have a world court decision and we would have had a Security Council resolution except that the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, so it's uncontroversial. And it's much worse than September 11th. You know, tens of thousands of people killed, you know, the country practically destroyed, may never recover. So how should Nicaragua have responded to uh, U.S. terror? Well, one possibility is to bomb Washington. Does anybody believe that's the way they should have responded? Uh, another might be, say, bioterror. Another may be assassinate the president. You know, anybody believe that that's a proper response? I mean, I've never seen anybody believe it. I certainly don't believe it. Okay, but if we don't believe that that was the right response to our atrocities, uh, then it's not the right response to their atrocities, uh, particularly when it's people who didn't even do it, like the people in Afghanistan had nothing to do with this. Uh, the, uh, so, so the real question is, should uh, Nicaragua have set off bombs in, I don't know, Oklahoma or something? It's ridiculous. So therefore, the entire Western response by Western standards is totally illegitimate. In fact, uh, let's take contemporary terrorism. Uh, plenty of it. I mean, September 11th was a terrorist atrocity. So is the reaction to it. Uh, literally literally, by the literal meaning of the word terrorism as defined in U.S. official documents. Terrorism is the calculated use, threat or use of violence to achieve political or other ends through intimidation or fear. All right. Suppose you announce to people, we're going to continue to bomb you unless you turn over to us people who we suspect of crimes though we're not going to provide you with any evidence and we're going to refuse negotiations. I'm quoting George Bush. That's terrorism in the literal sense, extreme terrorism. Or let's go on a couple of weeks later, a few weeks later, uh, end of October, the U.S. and Britain changed their war aims. They shifted it to change, overthrowing the regime. So uh, Admiral Boyce, the British Minister of Defense, announced uh, to the people of Afghanistan, we are going to, you have to understand that we're going to continue to bomb you until you get your leadership changed. Textbook illustration of terrorism. Okay, what's the right response? Is it to assassinate Bush and Boyce? To bomb the United States and England? No, it's not. Uh, so any of the responses that are taken are obviously illegitimate, at least if we rise to minimal moral levels. Well, how do you deal with it? Well, actually, there are proposals that make some sense, uh, like the Vatican, you know, those radicals in the Vatican, or um, take, say, Foreign Affairs, you know, the main establishment journal. In the current issue, it happens to have published an article, which was actually written in October, by Michael Howard, who's the preeminent Anglo-American military historian. He's got all the right credentials, very supportive of the British Empire, thinks the American Empire is even more wonderful. So perfect person, uh, well, uh, and a major military historian. What he says is, in the case of a criminal conspiracy, which is what this obviously was, uh, the right approach uh, is to uh, carry out careful police investigation, uh, find evidence as to who the perpetrators were, uh, if it's international and you have the evidence, go to an appropriate international authority, which could be, say, the Security Council, uh, under their authorization, carry out actions, if, if, you, if they won't turn them over to you, which they might have, uh, under their authorization, carry out actions to find and apprehend the perpetrators, bring them to an international tribunal where they can get a fair trial. Okay, well, that's an approach. And in fact, if we take that approach seriously, we would do the same thing to Admiral Boyce, uh, Tony Blair, George Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, uh, George Bush the first, and uh, anyone else. Uh, the people who are running the current war on terrorism, like Donald Rumsfeld, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's special advisor to the Middle East when they were terrorizing the whole region. Uh, John Negroponte, who's running the diplomatic side of the current war on terrorism. 
and was the proconsul in Honduras organizing the Contra armies attacking Nicaragua for which the U.S. was condemned by the World Court. Yeah, right down the list. We would do the same thing to them. Uh, that's assuming that we could reach minimal levels of moral, uh, of moral integrity. And of course, all of this is so remote from anything that you can even talk about in the West uh, that it's hard to say the words. But then there's an elementary conclusion that follows from that. Everyone in the West, and I have to include myself here because I don't propose this either, everyone in the West is such a total hypocrite uh, that for them even to talk about questions of right or wrong is a disgrace. Uh, why is there hatred against us there? George Bush's famous question. Well, everyone knows the answer to this. Uh, a couple of days after the, I mean, I have to distinguish two things here. Uh, there's a category of people called intellectuals. Their task is to make up fabrications uh, that protect power uh, and divert attention from what's obvious and indoctrinate people and so on. And they've concocted all sorts of complicated stories about globalization and, you know, failure to enter the modern world and this, that, and the other thing. Okay, we, and they envy us because we're so wonderful, etc., etc. All right, we can put all that aside. That's standard propaganda. Uh, let's talk about what is plainly the case uh, and is, in fact, discussed by serious people, like, say, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so a few days after the uh, September 11th, uh, the Wall Street Journal, to its credit, uh, began running uh, serious stories uh, in which they uh, investigated opinions of uh, people in the Islamic world who they are interested in, what they called moneyed Muslims, the ones with you know, the rich ones, the important ones. Uh, so bankers, uh, international lawyers, uh, directors of multinational corporations, uh, people who are right inside the U.S. system who certainly have no opposition to what's called globalization, in fact they're part of it, who certainly hate bin Laden because he's trying to kill them, you know, uh, but who nevertheless agree with much of what he says. Uh, and what they say is, their opinions are, that uh, the United States supports brutal and corrupt regimes which uh, block democracy and modernization and development. Uh, they oppose particular policies like the decisive U.S. support for the 35-year uh, uh, military occupation of um, Palestinian territory, which has been harsh and brutal and relies crucially on U.S. military and diplomatic support when you read in the newspapers that Israeli helicopters and jets are attacking Palestinians. That's total fabrication. U.S. jets and U.S. helicopters, which happen to be piloted by Israeli pilots, are attacking those concentrations. That's what ought to be said. Israel doesn't manufacture helicopters and, or F-16s. Uh, and uh, they understand all that. Uh, they know that the U.S. has been blocking any diplomatic settlement for actually for 30 years, since Sadat offered one in 1971. It's not reported here, and in the West it's not talked about much, but they know it, uh, the, uh, and uh, they know what's going on there. They also know perfectly well that uh, the U.S. and Britain are carrying out operations against Iraq, which are devastating the civilian society and strengthening Saddam Hussein. And they also remember, as Westerners like to forget, uh, that the U.S. has no, and Britain and France and Holland and so on, have no opposition, objection to Saddam Hussein's crimes. We know that for sure, because they support, supported Saddam Hussein right through the period of his worst crimes. You know, gassing the Kurds, uh, Anfal, uh, chemical weapons. They continued to support him very happily. He remained a good, favored friend and ally of the West, which helped provide him with the means for developing weapons of mass destruction when he was really dangerous. So they listen when Tony Blair and Madeleine Albright condemn Saddam because, you know, the ultimate monster even gassed his own people. They listen, but they add the words that are excluded in the West. They say, yeah, he committed those crimes with your support. Okay, rather crucial omission, which you never hear from Tony Blair and the rest. Uh, but they are not that indoctrinated, so they remember that those elementary truths. And those are other reasons why, if you want, there's hatred against us. Furthermore, there's absolutely nothing new about this. Uh, anybody who wants to understand any of it knows exactly where to go. You go to the declassified U.S. record. U.S. is a very open society. We have declassified 
records of internal deliberations from the past. All these questions came up decades ago. So in 19, and I had the same answers. Uh, in 1958, uh, crucial year for many reasons, uh, look, I'm now talking about internal records, uh, the U.S. So the Eisenhower administration discussed three major crises for the United States. One was Indonesia, one was North Africa, third was the Middle East. All Islamic countries, all oil producers. Uh, the question arose whether the Russians were involved. That was dismissed as ludicrous, no Russian involvement. Uh, it's just independent nationalism in the three countries, which was the main crisis. Uh, then Eisenhower pointed out, with regard to the Middle East, in his, his words, approximately, he said, there is a campaign of hatred against us, not by the governments, but by the people. Uh, and that, that was an issue that was discussed. No globalization, you know, no, they hate us because we have McDonald's and none of this stuff. Uh, why is there a campaign of hatred against us? Well, the National Security Council discussed it. That's the highest analysis and planning body. And they said uh, the problem is that there's a perception among the people of the region that the United States supports uh, corrupt and harsh regimes which prevent democratization and development and does so because of its interest in controlling Near East oil. And they said it's hard to counter this perception because it's true. Uh, and furthermore, it should be true because we should uh, support those regimes in order to maintain our control over Near East oil. So therefore, it's, there is a campaign of hatred against us by the people who see that we're robbing their resources uh, and preventing democracy and development, but you know, we can't do much about it because that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, well, you know, like I say, no McDonald's, no envying us our magnificence, uh, no globalization, just perfectly obvious things. You know, same reason why there was a campaign of hatred against England from the people of India or against Holland from the people of the East Indies and so on and so forth. Yeah, you crush people under your boot, they don't like it. So there's a campaign of hatred against you. In fact, what they, what they were discussing internally in 1958 is the same as what the Wall Street Journal found in, uh, in, in, 19, uh, in 2001, you know, uh, and for the same reasons because the policies haven't fundamentally changed. So that's, so we understand, uh, I mean, the Wall Street Journal only was concerned with elite opinion. If they'd gone down to the slums of Cairo, they would have gotten stronger opinions, but of the same kind, and more different ones also, because in the slums of Cairo, they wouldn't like the fact that the wealth of the region is going to the West and not to the people of the region. Uh, the ones who the Wall Street Journal was talking about are quite happy about that because they're part of the ruling elite and they enrich themselves while the resources go to the West. So they're part of the imperial system. So you get different opinions if you bother to ask uh, people in the so-called streets. Uh, but fundamentally, it's the same. So there's a camp, so, there, so Bin Laden's messages certainly resonate. And people agree with a lot of the things he's saying. Uh, about 80% of Egyptians, for example, say that the most important issue to them is uh, the crushing of the Palestinians. So when they hear Bin Laden say it, they agree. It has nothing to do with whether they like him or hate him. Uh, on the other hand, there is a clique of uh, terror, uh, radical Islamists who were organized and trained and brought together by Western intelligence for their own purposes and have continued to do for 20 years just what they've always said they were going to do. So. While some things are obscure, I don't think these are obscure. I think the answers are quite transparent.